What is an objective measure of evidence? In Bayesian hypothesis testing, the evidence will update the prior odds to the posterior odds. This is Bayes' theorem expressed in the odds version. The prior odds are the relative probabilities of the two hypotheses, where we can interpret probability as the belief or the plausibility of a hypothesis. So we multiply the prior odds by a Bayes factor to get the posterior odds. The Bayes factor is the probability of the data under one hypothesis over its probability under the other hypothesis. And these probabilities are calculated as marginal likelihoods. We take the probability of the data under the parameter beta and we integrate that probability over a prior distribution for the parameter. The problem is how do we specify an objective prior distribution for the parameter? Here's an example of the kind of problems that occur when we try to do this. Suppose we're measuring something, let's call it mu, and we're going to test whether mu is zero without any idea of what other value it might have. Our measurements will be normally distributed with a measurement error of one. Suppose we get a measurement of two, then the p-value is less than 0.05, so traditionally we could conclude that mu is not zero. If we calculate base factors, then the more vague our prior gets, the more the base factor favours the null hypothesis that mu is zero. However, the credible interview for mu is quite stable, and it suggests a value that's different from zero. This is the essence of the jeffries lindley paradox. If your prior is too vague, you can get evidence that seems to be at odds with the parameter estimate and with a frequentist analysis. What we would like is to find a distribution that we could use in a Bayes factor, which remains somehow compatible with the parameter estimate we get, but is still vague with respect to prior knowledge. How can we do that? Well, the only way, really, is to use the posterior distribution itself in the Bayes factor. So now we have what's called the posterior marginal likelihood. Again, we are integrating the likelihood over the parameter beta, but the integration is now taken over the posterior distribution of the parameter. This gives us posterior Bayes factors as proposed by Aitken back in the 1990s. Now this didn't go down too well. As summarised here in the definitive review of Bayes factors, the procedure has little Bayesian justification and does not have any known frequentist optimality properties. But in the first part of this talk I argued that strict Bayesian or frequentist inference is not actually what we're doing most of the time. We can be a bit relaxed about strict Bayesian justification or frequentist optimality. What we want is a good objective measure of the evidence. There is still the issue of whether the posterior Bayes factor is somehow biased because it uses the data twice. Once to get the posterior distribution, then again to get the Bayes factor. The question nobody seems to have asked is this. If it uses the data twice, then to what extent does it overstate the evidence? Well, to answer that, we have to decide what we are comparing the posterior Bayes factor to. Our proposal is to look at the Bayes factor you would expect to get from an independently supplied prior. We can calculate the resulting bias and in a large sample it turns out that the bias in log scale is half the number of parameters. If we correct the posterior Bayes factor for that bias, we get empirical Bayes factors. Here are some empirical Bayes factors for tests of a normal random variable Z. 
A lot of tests in large samples come down basically to testing whether a standard normal variable is zero. And so the empirical base factor looks like that. These are in favour of the null hypothesis, so you would take a reciprocal to get the empirical base factor for the alternative. You can get one-tailed tests as well, and the multivariate version gives an equivalent to chi-squared tests. We can get empirical base factors for a range of other tests, and a particularly convenient version comes if you've only got the p-value to hand. That might be, say, from doing a non-parametric test. If we assume that the p-value comes from a beta distribution, then we can obtain this calibration. The empirical Bayes factor is simply 10 times the p-value. Going back to our example, the empirical base factor is now less than 1, pointing towards a value of mu different from 0. And that's now concordant with the parameter estimates and the p-value. So we've seen that there's an equivalence between z-scores or p-values and empirical Bayes factors. And here we have a plot on log scale comparing p-values and empirical Bayes factors. In red is the two-sided test of a normal variable, and in blue is the calibration for 10 times the p-value. You can see that they're quite similar, and you can also see that there's almost a linear relation in log scale between p-values and empirical Bayes factors. So you might be asking, what's the point of using these EBFs? Why don't we just stick with p-values? I would say that the reason is really to do with interpretation. There's a lot of discussion about interpretation of p-values. It seems that they're easy to misinterpret, and the discussion is largely about whether we should do a better job of explaining their interpretation, or just replace them with something else. I would argue that EBFs are more intuitive to interpret. You can draw an analogy with temperature. Historically, temperature was measured in Fahrenheit, and then at some point, most of the world moved towards the Celsius scale. There's a linear relation between the two, but the reason we work with Celsius rather than Fahrenheit is because it has a more intuitive interpretation. The same thing applies to EBFs here. In a sense, we are reporting the same evidence as a p-value does, but the EBF has a more intuitive interpretation. And in fact, you can get evidence for either hypothesis from an EBF. So that's our objective measure of evidence, and next we'll discuss what actually counts as a strong degree of evidence.